Okay, well, we're going to get started here today. My name is uh, David Eastwood. I'm with the Geotech Engineering and Testing. And uh, okay, they say, okay, good. Everybody can see me and hear me. That's good. Uh, I am David Eastwood with Geotech Engineering and Testing. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is environmental geotechnical considerations for design of buildings. Um, it's going to be mostly a design concept deal. Audience, we got about 225 people RSVP, mostly engineers, uh, some builders, and some attorneys. Let's see. You got, if you need to get a hold of me, my, my name is David Eastwood. My email is de at geoteching.com. My number is 713 699 I'm working for Geotech Engineering and Testing. We're located in Houston. We've been around for 36 years. We do geotechnical, environmental materials, and geoforensics. We have 60 people, and we work all over Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. And we have all rigs, so we can mobilize on projects quickly. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A section. And so I got some questions here. Uh, somebody said there's an echo. So I don't know why you got an echo, but most other people can hear me. I guess, uh, bad echo. Yeah. Yeah, here's, uh, William says he can hear me. Robert Winston says I can see you and hear you. Allah Muhammad is a bad echo. I don't know what causes the echo. Let me check with my IT here. Let's see. Vicky, can you hear me or there's an echo? Okay. Okay, we're working on that. So hopefully we can get it going. And uh, yeah, some of the people say here they have no echo. No echo, no echo, no echo. Okay, so some people don't have echo. So we're going to work on it. If you got a site that looks like this, uh, or a site that looks like this, or like this, you're going to do, before you buy that property, you got to do some feasibility study. That feasibility study basically is a phase one environmental site assessment. That's ASTM 1527-21. Actually, that's the new one that just came out. If you got a site that got a service stations right next to it, and um, if that service station is old and it's got leaky storage tanks, and these are the tanks, they're leaking, uh, and they can leak into your property, basically through the plume going from this property to your property, you're responsible for the cleanup cost. If you got these uh, barrels here, they're leaking, they can contaminate the soil and uh, can cause contamination of the groundwater. And uh, so you're responsible for the cleanup cost. Here's out there near Texas City, out there near Galveston. If these tanks here leak and you're gonna develop this property here, you're responsible for the cleanup cost. So, you got to be, you know, very careful. You know, somebody else can cause contamination on your property and you are responsible for the cleanup cost. You can go back, try to get your money from these guys who caused it. But uh, in general, you are responsible uh, for all the cleanup costs. Okay, so you got a contaminated site. You know, as a part of the phase one environmental assessment, you say, hey, this site is contaminated and we don't want it. You got a pipeline going through your, your property, and if that pipeline is leaking, that can cause contamination. You, want, you don't want that property. If you're ne next to a landfill, and these landfills, they got you know waste materials in them. Some of them are sanitary, some of them are hazardous. If it rains, water leaches through these wastes, gets to the groundwater, so we need to make sure these are protected, and that can impact your property. If you got a cleaner and this cleaner has got on-site cleaning tank 
And if these tanks leak and get to the soil and groundwater and can cause these solvents, can cause contamination, and uh, they're not good. So the TCEQ, Texas uh, Commission on Environmental Quality, they have major you know, requirements as it relates to the cleaners. If you're out there in the Midtown, Houston, and uh, or Dallas, you go out there, they got these old buildings out there, and uh, you're going to tear them down. You're going to worry about asbestos and lead-based paint. So you're going to have to do a management of that materials, take them to the proper landfill. Uh, cemeteries, you can't do anything with them. So you can't do build anything on the cemetery. So if it was this your site that looked like this, okay, look at the date on this. Let's see what the date is. Um, I can move this. Okay, this is a 1938 site picture or aerial photo. Then he goes to 1944 to build that subdivision. Look at all this stuff around it now. You got cleaners, car wash, service station, chemical plants. This is Pasadena, by the way. And the service station. And so these things can cause contamination to this site. So it's a risk-based analysis. We're trying to find out what the risk of the contamination is uh, uh, to the site. Um, so you got to have to watch for that. Here's another site in Pearland. This is our site here, right here next to it. You got Credit Union. Uh, you got Golden Corral Restaurant. You come over here. You got Kroger Gas Station, Exxon service, service Stations. So if these service stations are up gradients and higher in elevation and contaminate the soil and groundwater, that can come over here and impact this property. So they're a risk to a property. So, you know, this again, you have to check the files for these Exxon and Kroger gas stations. Make sure they're not contaminated. Here's a site out there in um, in the Heights. This is North Main. This site, they had a house on it back in the old days. This is uh, the year on this is, let's see. Oh, I can tell what the year is. Um, I can't tell, but I think that's 1925 year, and uh, there was a there was a house there, and then going out there again and looking at it, uh, somebody built a service station here, and they built houses. So when we went out there, somebody wanted to buy the property, his track, and, and the, the service station was all con contaminated, so they had to dig out all the contaminated soils and have them backfill with select fill. Uh, otherwise, this whole area here would have been contaminated. Uh, uh, here's the uh, site near Kingwood, and, and uh, you see all the red stuff is the oil wells. <clears throat> and these oil wells can cause contamination. Wherever you have oil, oil wells, you can have oil pits, and this pits you can have contaminated, you know, oil in it, and can get go to the soil and groundwater. There was a project out there near the Woodlands area that had a bunch of wells on it. And uh, I guess they didn't check them real well. And so they were out there putting the streets in and they hit a bunch of uh, oil pits. And that just stopped the project because they had contamination. These are the oil wells. This is your site. And we go one mile around radius. Check everything around it, all these red stuff are things that can cause contaminate on this site. We evaluate the risk of this contamination from these sites on this site. You get a table that looks like this, that it says, for example, LUSTs, leaky underground storage tanks. There's 14 of them within one mile. There's one of them within one eighth of a mile, one within one eighth to one fourth of a mile. UST underground storage tanks, there's 12 of them near this site. So as again, feasibility, you do a phase one environmental site assessment, you do site reconnaissance, regulatory agency review, historical use review, interview, property title reviews. And then you know, if there's asbestos and lead-based paint, you check those areas and uh, you do an O&M 
management. And if there is potential for contamination, you do what's called a phase two environmental site assessment. Phase two environmental site assessment is done based on ASTM E1903. And, you know, you go to the site, for example, you start digging and you see a bunch of contaminated soils, free products, what we call oil and gas. You know, you can see the manhole is, you know, oil underneath it. And you see that a lot on the east part of Houston, along 225 out there, east of downtown. A lot of contaminated sites out there. You dig out and see contaminated soils and um, contaminated water. A uh, pipeline busted along, around the neighborhood. More pipeline busted. Damage to wildlife. This is a wellhead we we found out there near Cypresswood area. Uh, they were putting their streets and nobody had picked that up. TCQ had no record of it. So we had to do some borings around it to make sure it's not contaminated. Remediation, uh, if your site is contaminated, one of the techniques that you can use uh, is, is dig out the contaminated soils and uh, cover them with plastic and uh, take them to a, put them in a proper box, take them to a hazardous waste, uh, basically a landfill, backfill the whole thing with structural fill, compactly lift eight inches, 95% standard product density, so that you can build stuff on top of it. Wetlands, if you're developing a piece of property around Texas, you got to worry about wetlands. We've got wetlands in Houston, and we've got Montgomery County, Galveston County, Brazoria County, Fort Bend County. So you got to watch out for wetlands. Wetlands are basically areas that are inundated and saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency duration su sufficient to support and on the normal circumstances do support a Prevalence of vegetation typically adopted for saturated soils conditions. Wetlands include swamps, marshes, bogs, and similar areas, regulated by U.S. Corps of Engineers. So typical wetland area. You can see the water was all the way up to here. We have a lot of wetland in Galveston County. You're out there I'm driving on 45, I took a picture of this. This is in Texas City. Well, we developed this subdivision here. Our client did. And of course, we couldn't do anything here. There was a wetland. These are typical wetlands of uh, vegetation that grow out there. You see more wetland pictures. To have wetland, you should have water. Plants that grow in a saturated condition. And soils that are hydric soils, black smelly soils. You have to have all three conditions to have wetlands. Hydric soils, black, you know, the soils being underwater. Water loving vegetation, wetland hydrology, saturation for seven days during growing season. Um, how do we know the water that's on the site is jurisdictional? Well, you know, you deal with Corps of Engineers. There's a form that you go fill out out there. There's a short form and long form. Typically, you can handle it with a short form and get it done. The wetland delineation should be conducted in accordance with the 1987 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Detention Manual, Delineation Manual. All right, now the uh, beginning to the meat of the problem, subsidence, okay? In Houston area and uh, around all major cities around Texas, we take use a lot of groundwater. As you take that water and you out of the ground, the ground starts subsiding, basically increasing the effective stress on soils and the soil starts settling. Subsidence is the lowering of the elevation of the land surface over time. Subsidence can have a wide range of consequences depending on the location of the occurrence in proximity to surface drainage and coastal areas. In this area, clay compaction resulting from groundwater removal is the primary cause of the subsidence. So you take that groundwater out, the area starts dropping. But notice the engineers from the old times, by the way, guys. They're all in suit and everything. Pretty cool looking. Um, here, are Texas aquifers, you know, you got the Chicote aquifer, Evangeline, you got Jasper all the way down. This guy can go up to about, you know, 600, 800,000 feet deep or deeper. 
Jasper is 2,500 feet deep. Uh, these are big bodies of sand. This is sloping all the way to Galveston. You know, this is a slope that causes what we call faulting. With time, this whole thing just kind of moves and causes cracks and stuff. And uh, as we take this water out of these aquifers, the area starts dropping. Here's a more accurate uh, map of our aquifers that go all the way to Cleveland, to uh, Umble here. And they go all the way down to about 8,000 feet deep. These are big formations of sand, like Frio. You know, the Chico, it goes all the way down to about 1,200 feet deep. So Jasper goes all the way down to about 8,000 feet deep. So when you take that water, the ground starts dropping. This is out there near a Goose Creek oil field. This area was above the water, but uh, three foot of subsidence put it underneath the water. The areas that they experience this subsidence, they usually uh, have uh, flooding problems. <laughs> this is an oil well, Baytown. That's what the ground level used to be, and now it is down here. There's a space now. Kingwood area flood due to subsidence. This is a subdivision, Brownwood, I think. Yeah, Brownwood subdivision, 1944. 1953, 1978, and you can see in 1989, 2002, 2012, the thing is just disappearing due to subsidence. And when the area subsides, there's problems with flooding. This is a map that shows the subsidence in the Houston area in feet. And you can see out there in the two ship channel area, you have as much eight, nine foot of the subsi subsidence. That's between 1906 and 1987. And this thing does not come back, okay? It does not come back. Here's a later, the University of Houston the drawing that shows Montgomery County subsidence in Harris County. You can see these areas are subsiding at a rate of about 1.16 millimeters or 1.6 centimeter a year, half an inch or so. So Montgomery County is dropping at a rate of half an inch a year. Of course, Harris County is going through that too. That's a predicted subsidence between 1995 and 2030. And you can see parts of Houston have as much as five feet of uh, subsidence. If you don't go to a surface water system, we are going to a surface water system. That's why we have North Harris County Water Authority, West Houston Water Authority, North Fort Bend Water Authority, and San Jacinto and others. And as we go to surface water, getting the waters from Lake Livingston or Lake Conroe, we are reducing subsidence. Here's the map of the settlement versus years. And that's what we call extensiometer. It's a device that measures the, uh, the settlement. That's attic's area. And you can see this thing has been dropping at a rate of about significant, about half an inch a year or so. Pasadena start dropping, but then leveled off because they've gone to a surface water system. Faulting. So if you got part of town that's sloping towards Galveston and it's creeping all the way, and also you're taking that water from the soil and the air is dropping. There are cracks that have been in the, in the ground for millions of years. These cracks start showing up as faulting. And this is out there, Ellington Field Airport. You can see Ellington Fault there underneath the building. This fault can extend you know, a couple of hundred feet deep, the crack. There are about 300 faults in the Texas coastal area from Corpus Christi to Beaumont. They move an average rate of about half an inch a year. Some of them stop moving and then start moving again. I mean, like Long Point, stop moving for a while and then start moving again. Here's the fault going this way. And you can see this is what we call downthrown section, the lower area. This is the upthrown section. This is called shear zone of a fault. So if you build a structure on top of these faults, you're going to have problems. Again, this is the upthrown section, downthrown section. See the lineation of the fault going this way. This is in the Woodlands area. 
going to show the picture of the fault. This is a house that's built on top of the fault, and you can see it's got a lot of distress. Here's the lineation of the fault. You can see from aerial photo going through the parking lot, cracking the parking lot, going towards the building. Again, this is the bump out there. You can see on the drive on the streets. Here's the bump. Here's the bump. This is Post Oak Fault out there, north of Galleria. So a fault basically has got a component called, this is the scarp fault, scarp, that's the crack. These are the layers of the soil. So one area down to like when it drops, the layers become out of whack. For example, if this is clay and this is clay, when you have a fault, it drops. So you can do borings in here and here and see where the elevations of these soils are. And from that, you can see where the scarp is. You can do resistivity tests and the SP testing and to determine that. These are the lineation of the fault. This is the downthrown section, upthrown section. This area is darker uh, because it's been underwater. So as it's lower in elevation, so that's the downthrown, downthrown section. And it, it basically is greener. You see the lineation of the fault in here. This is the downthrown section, the upthrown section. Here's a downthrown section that's flooding, upthrown section. Here's the fault. In the areas that are heavily wooded, trying to get the fault information, um, we have to use LIDAR because if you have tall grass and, uh, you know, and trees, you, you can't pick the, you know, fault scarp by just going on and looking at it. So we use LIDAR. Bash uses light, uses a laser, uh, and he picks up the elevation change, and it goes through the trees and stuff. Here's the lidar map. You can see the lineation of the Long Point Fault. That was the property these guys were buying. The fault's going right through it, so they have to design the buildings and around this fault. You can't build them here. And you can see some of the faults that are going all the way from East Texas, you know, all the way. These, these are some of the faults that are in Texas. Some of the faults, like in Dallas and San Antonio, Austin, they don't move. They're not like ours. We Ours move. Here's the Gulf Coast area. And you got the faulting. If you're in Dallas and San Antonio, if you got a fault going through your property, make sure you do a lot of borings. Because the soils across the fault are different. One area can be clay, the other area can be sand. So that's, you need to check that. This is again LIDAR map of the faulting in Houston. More fault maps. These are on our website. If you want to go to our website, you can download some of these things. This presentation will also be available on YouTube channel that we have. So you can go back and watch it. You're not going to get everything on just watching it at one time. You have to do it several times to get some of the ideas that we have here. You can see uh, the defaults out here. This is the downthrown section where these little picks are. And um, this is the downthrown section, this upthrown section. This is a track in, the, in, in Pearland. Developer wanted to buy this track. It's in near Makoa Salt Dome. See all the faults out there in the area. Here's the track, fault going right through it. And there's a pipeline going through it. So we had to develop what's called a hazard zone around the fault lineation. Downthrown section is twice as much as the upthrown section. So if this is 120 foot wide, the bottom side is about 80 foot, the upper side is about you know 40 foot. So it's so a 40 foot in the up, up thrown section, 80 foot in the down thrown section. This is a school project out on Pearland Parkway, right next to the fault. We told them not to build a, the school next to the fault. They did, they put it on deep piers. These are the piers with anchor bolts. This is the beam underneath the building. So they go and adjust it every once in a while if there's any movement. Okay, so we did our preliminary work. We checked our environmental problem potentially. We checked our faulting. Now we need to do a soil test to see if the property that we're buying to build something on 
a building or a house, you know, it's good. So we do soil testing. This is our building. This is our rigs. We've got eight rigs. This rig goes 120 feet deep. This rig goes 120 feet deep. These are portable rigs go down 20 feet, you know, if you have access to wooded areas or the backyard. And these, these other rigs here go down about 25 foot deep. We got an ATV that we can put a portable rig behind it. So if you got a dry site that looks like this or like this, it's dry, we use what we call our, our, our truck rig. And uh, these rigs can drive on a dry site. They don't get stuck. If your site is wet, we got to use buggy rigs. These are big tire rigs. They're more expensive. And uh, they get, you know, they don't get stuck most of the time. So this is Fort Wayne County. It's a subdivision we do the soil test on. And that's a buggy rig that we use. And this is our ATV. We pull a portable rig behind it and do the boring with the portable rig if the side is wet and soft. If the area is wooded, we we'll go out there and clear a path. I mean, in areas like woodlands, they don't like to cut any trees. So, we, you know, we go out there and surgically cut a path out there and uh, send the rig out there, do the borings. In some areas, we have to use our portable rig because of the access or elevation. This is Hobby Airport. We had to use a portable rig because then you want the mass to stick out in the airport. It's a portable rig that we drill right next to the tree. Trees tell us a lot about foundation systems and root fibers. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But, you know, when you do foundation design, you do boring next to the biggest tree on the property. I don't care about doing boring necessarily underneath the building. You, you got to do that anyway. But put some of the borings next to the trees to get your root fibers. It's very important to kind of put in the report where your root fibers are because your active zone is two foot below the, the moisture active zone is two foot below the uh, lowest root fiber, okay? That's the moisture active zone. You get your samples by driving this hammer on the rod like that. You drill next to the trees. This is a Shelby tube sampler. It's a hollow tube. Get your samples like that. Cut the ends, you log them, job number, depth, boring two, what depth it is, put them in a the box. It's a wax box to keep the moisture constant. Log all the root fibers when you go to the lab. Again, your moisture active zone is two foot below the lowest root fiber. You can see the root fiber here. In the areas, the soils are sandy, like in the Woodlands area, Bridgeland. If you're in those I-10, you know, if you're out there near Sealy, Texas, or these areas have got a lot of sand out there, you go out there and use what's called standard penetration test. A standard penetration test, you get a 140-pound hammer, you drop to 30 inches. Standard penetration test is the hammer. You drop it 30 inches and you drop the oil, uh, you drop the... Um, All right, I got an issue here. Let's see if I can. Um, got stuck here somehow. So this is what we call a split spoon sampler. Yes, and uh, uh, this is the sand, the material. Yeah, it doesn't move. Oh, you double clicked it or something. All right. So, again, this is split spoon sampler. Uh, going back, uh, that's a 140 pound hammer driving to the ground 18 inches, six inch, six inch, and six inch. 
split spoon hand, sound plug, you see the sand. If your blow count is zero to four, to drive this sampler into the soil 18 inches, you basically disregard top six inches. You count the blows on the bottom 12 inches. If it's zero to four blow counts, you got very loose sand, like you got the surface sand in the woodlands area. Five to 10, you got loose sand. Again, supply surface soils out there near Katy area. Uh, you got the medium dense, start going deeper, about 10 foot deep or so, you're gonna get blow counts between 11 to 30. Then sand, you go about 40, 50 feet deep. You got bull counts like 31 to 50. Very dense, you go about, you know, below 50 feet or so, you're going to get into some of that stuff. Somebody's got a question. Uh, somebody, oh, Hilda Scott says, NWHCWA, challenges are recommending a view of the 2025 candidates uh, mandates on whether subsiding district recommendation still valid. Is that a valid concern? I mean, subsidence is still occurring. And I don't know what necessarily what the recommendations of the uh, subsidence district are, but uh, every time you ground, take groundwater out, you're gonna get uh, subsidence. And with time, you may get, you know, faulting. So, uh, if you want to be more specific, I haven't heard anything from subsidence district. And uh, you're going to start going deeper, we're going to hit rock. Rock is about 2,500 feet deep in Houston. So, um, you start quarrying for rock. That's what the rock looks like. Put it in a box like this. Groundwater measurements, groundwater depth in Houston can range anywhere from 15, 20 feet, 30 feet deep. You go to San Antonio, that water table is about 60 foot deep. You go to Dallas, that water table is about 40 foot deep in some areas. So the more rainfall you have, the shallower your groundwater is. And groundwater in the drought season, like we have right now, is deep. If you go out there when we have a lot of rain, like in February, your groundwater is shallow. The way you measure groundwater, you get a tape measure and you put a weight underneath it and um, drop it in the hole when it goes plump. That's when you hit the water, you measure the water level. Perch water table, this is another water table that we have in Houston area where we have sand over clay, like we have in the woodlands and in, in, in Katy area. You know, you go to Sealy, Columbus, you got these sandy soils over clay. It's sandy loam, you know, water just sits in it on top of the impermeable clay underneath it. The water is trapped there, so it's bathtub effect. You dig a hole near the surface, gets filled up with water. It's called perch water table. Preliminary studies, due diligence studies. So if you got a site, you want to go and develop it and build it, build a uh, commercial buildings on it, you may go out there as part of your due diligence. Do some borings on the property, just see what kind of soils you have. You just scatter the borings all over the property. Uh, and typically, number of borings, if you got for design purposes for buildings, um, you know, one boring every 3,000 to 10,000 feet for buildings, a depth of 25 feet for commercial buildings, parking lot, one boring every 10,000 feet to a depth of uh, 10 feet. So, Here's a building out here that they're going to build out here next to the freeway. We're doing like uh, borings here. I got four borings in the building, five borings in the parking lot to a depth of 10 feet. These borings are going to be 25 foot deep. If you start getting to bigger structures, your boring is going to be a lot deeper and the frequency is going to be higher. So if I'm doing a hospital like this, my borings may be 100 foot deep and do have one boring that'd be 10,000 square feet. Make sure I get the soils. I don't want to you know, it's very expensive if structures like this start having settlement problems. Again, here your borings may be 50, 60 feet deep. If you're doing a little bank projects, you know, Wells Fargo here, you know, you do a couple of two, three foot board, three borings here, 20 foot deep. 
in a couple of three boardings here for parking lot, 10 foot deep or five foot deep. Excuse me. Uh, so Walmart, they have their own specifications. For a typical Walmart, you may do on a <laughs> large building, 18 borings. These borings are about 25 foot deep. They use a lot of CMU on the Walmarts blocks and when they do construction. Parking lots usually do one boring every 10,000 or 40,000 square feet, depending on their spec. Again, you go to HEB and all that, all these areas, you need to have borings out there underneath them, both parking lots, building, detention pond, all those areas need to be tested. So if you got shopping center near the woodland, for example, uh, you do borings out of here, 25 foot deep. Same with school projects. Uh, you got to put 25 foot borings on their school projects. Most of them are, you know, built with sticks, uh, block construction or, or steel frame with brick exterior. Tail wall buildings, make sure you do one boring every 10,000 square foot. You don't want those to have panels to settle. For apartment complexes, uh, this is the typical apartment complex. You try to do one boring at each building. You do a boring where the pool is. You got to get <laughs> specific <laughs> pool recommendations. So you do at least one boarding where the buildings are and maybe do something for the parking. Churches, they got always budget conscience on the on the churches. You do like four boardings here, 25 foot deep, and uh, some in the parking lots. Some of these churches, you know, they got heavy loads on them. So something like this, you may have to go down 50, 60 feet deep on your borings and have recommendations on deep foundations such as deep drill piers, mat foundations, or auger cast piles. Some of these high rise or mid rises, you got to do borings out there inside of them, one boring every 10,000 square foot. These borings may be 100 foot deep. Downtown Chase Tower, you know, 150 foot borings out there. Um, <coughs> Laboratory testing, uh, you do get some of the soil samples, you add enough water in it, to, it becomes liquid, it's called liquid limit test. You wonder how much water we should add to the soil for it to behave liquid. And uh, we, we take a cup, fill it up with water and start mixing it. And when it becomes liquid, we take that sample, we put a cup like this, you turn the handle 20, 30 times. When the grooves come together, you get a sample of that with this little spatula, that's the wet weight of the soil. You know how wet it is. You put it in the oven and dry it up, you get the dry weight of it. So you know how much water is in the soil for it to behave liquid. We want to also know how much water is in the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. We take the soil, roll it into one eighth of an inch. It's called plastic limit. Take the soil, roll it to one eighth of an inch. Get the dry weight of it. <laughs> put it in the oven and dry it up. Get the wet weight of it. So. The difference between liquid and plastic limit moisture contents is called PI or plasticity index. This is something that you all need to be aware of. If your plasticity index is less than 20, you got low swell potential. A 20 and 30 is moderately expansive. Between 30 and 40 is highly expansive. Above 40 is very high. And we got a lot of expansive soils in Texas. So we got to design for it. Otherwise, the building starts cracking. A couple of the other tests we do in the lab is called hand penetrometer test and uh, tour vein test. In a hand penetrometer test, we take the soil sample, you push the hand penetrometer into the soil, you can read the kind of strength it has. Tour vein, you put it in the back, back end of the soil, sure the torsion, you can read what kind of strength it has. Unconfined compression test, you got the loading ring here with the loading dial gauge and deflection. You crush the soil. It tells you the bearing capacity, how much you can load put on those footings for it not to settle. So it gives you the bearing capacity. Consolidation test, we put a soil sample in a mold like this, in a ring like this. And you put it in a cell like this. Then you start loading it to what the structure is going to experience. 
measure the deflection, and from that he can find out how much that soil is going to settle um, when you put a load on it. We call it consolidation test. Soil types. Around Texas, we got a lot of clays, gumbo clays. This is a clay site. We got sandy soils. You like, like go to the beach, Galveston Beach. You got a lot of sandy soils there. This is sandy soil out there in the woodlands. Got the sandy silty soils. Silt's grain size is bigger than clay, it's smaller than sand, and they're hard to build on. So it's a silty site. You can get stuck in it. This is in Midland, Texas. It's a real silty site in here. So we got clay, you go deeper, you're going into red clay, you go deeper, you run into a white clay, go deeper and get into weather rock. This is the weather rock. Also, we have fill. A lot of the projects, when we get a piece of property, we have to do what's called mass grading. We're going to have to grade the whole site so that we can put our buildings on it and don't get flooded and all that. So you may use a detention pond soils to put underneath the buildings and raise the site. And so you come up with fill. The fill is a heterogeneous material. Could be clay, sandy clay, silty sand. Typically, we don't want to use sandy soils as fill. As long as it doesn't have much organics in it that can decay and settle, then we can build on top of it as long as it's properly compacted. It's a soil that's experiencing in the summertime due to drought. It's called shrinkage cracks. They tell you the depth of active zone. Okay, so and what happens is uh, the, uh, this, the soil starts shrinking and cracking. And with time, it gets filled with uh, debris. And as the, the soil, we get a rainfall, the, the soil starts heaving up. It doesn't have enough void in it anymore because it's filled up with debris. It cracks at 45 degree angle. These are called slick insides. So if you go out there and start putting piers in on your job, your soil is hard, but the whole thing starts caving in. That's because of presence of slick insides. Also, slick insides define the depth of moisture active zone. So engineering analysis. If you go around Texas, you can see the expansive soils. Here's Texas and Louisiana, you got a lot of expansive soils. Soils in Texas are variable, so it's important to have a soil test for every project. Here's a soil that may up to 1500% US Corps of Engineers that has got all over the US. So we got a lot of expansive soils. You see the Texas and Louisiana red stuff is the expansive soils, more expansive soils in Texas. You can see the cities like, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth area, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, Beaumont, Corpus Christi, Brownsville. All these cities are located in the areas where they got highly expansive soils. So, as an example, if you got Houston and you go around Houston, try to see what kind of soils we have. Um, started the spring area, the woodlands. You got lots of sandy soils over there, low PI soils. You go to Kingwood, you got sandy soils, and then some areas, highly expansive soils with trees, high PVR values. Go to Crosby, Highland, Mobile View, Channel View, Galena Park, Pasadena, South Houston, Missouri City, Sugarland, Pecan Grove, Rosenberg. <laughs> All these areas got highly expansive soils. Friendswood, Pearland, Lake City, Dickinson. You start going out there on the west side of Houston, Cinco Ranch, uh, your soils become sandy with low PVR. Ridgeland, Farfield, all these areas, they got, you know, low PI soils. You go to Tomball, parts of Tomball, you got highly expansive soils. Part of it is non-expansive. Conroe has got the same. You go south of Conroe on Loop 336, you got all sand. You go out there in the north part, northwest, you got lots of gumbo clay. Some of the real bad gumbo clays are near Conroe. You get a boring log when we do borings. And uh, let's see, you got from zero to two feet fill, fat clay, gumbo clay, below that two foot all the way down to 16 feet. You got fat clay, gumbo, 
PIs of 39, 37. This guy here in the field has got a PI of 75. Below that, you got silty sand from 11 foot to 20 feet. Water table was hit when they were drilling at 14 feet. When they hit the sand, the hydrostatic pressure put it to about 12 foot. So the strengths are not very high. Strength somewhere between 0.5 to 1.0 TSF. You can put drill piers in it, no problem. You know. One of the things we do with in soils engineering, it's not like structural engineers. They can specify the material that they want to have and what kind of a strength it has. With soils engineers, we have to deal with what's out there. So we plot the data to see if we find trends. If this is our boring out there, we plot the moisture content versus depth. High moisture content near the top, then it becomes dry, then because it starts picking back up again. When you have high moisture content, you got low total unit weight. You got low moisture content, you got higher total unit weight. Undrained strength, when you have high moisture content, you have low strength. And the moisture content drops, your strength increases. We we'll also develop what's called st soil stratigraphy. Uh, layer one, layer two, layer three, layer one is clay. Layer two is sand, layer three is clay. So if I'm putting, you know, drill piers out here, depending on the soil, I may have to put the piers below the sand layer or above the sand layer. If these clay is non-expansive, I'll put the piers above the sand layer. If the soils are expansive, I have to go through the sand, and put the piers here, you know, deep, deeper. Potential vertical rise. Potential vertical rise is expressed in inches, the ability of the soil material to swell. So depending on where you are in Texas, you will have a different PVR, potential vertical rise. It's by Textile 124E, it's been used for years. There are newer methods called potential vertical movements that's, that gives you values less than PVR, which is more accurate. PVR is pretty conservative. PBR values around Houston, I developed this map. And so if you go out there in the spring, Woodlands area, your PBR is 1.5, 1 to 4, Kingwood, 3 to 4, Crosby, you got 5 to 6, Mobile View, 5 to 6. You got here, League City, you can have 6, 7 inches of movement, PBR. Fresno, at least 5 inches. Missouri City, 4 or 5 inches. Sugarland, about 4 inches. Rosenberg, five, six inches. If you go out there near the, inside the city, Bel Air, West U, Tanglewood, where you got highly expansive soils, a bunch of big trees and lots of lawyers, your PBR is about four or five inches. Tanglewood, you know, movement about five, six inches. PBR for most buildings should be less than one inch that are on piers. So if your building is on pier, you want a PBR uh, less than one inch. So one of the ways, of course, you can reduce the PBR is putting a sprinkler system around the building. Keep it wet so that the moisture doesn't change. You get movement whenever the moisture, you know, goes from a dry to a wet condition or from a wet to a dry condition. If you keep that cycle from happening, you're not going to have movement. You make sure your deep, it's, great beam is deep, deeper your great beam, the less moisture underneath, underneath your slab. So if you have deeper grade beam, maybe 36 inch beams around the structure um, going down, you're gonna have less movement. So if you put paving all around the structure, with time, that building doesn't move anymore. Initially it's gonna move for a transient condition, but for a steady state, there's no change in movement, so it doesn't move. This building here has got a planted area. And unless you keep it moist, moist, moist all the time, it can move. So if you keep it moist all the time, it's not going to move. Here's what we call non-uniform moisture is not good. Uh, right here, you got paving here, you got grass. This area can move and you're going to get cracking here. Same with here, you get cracking here, this paving doesn't move. This area moves. And you want to have a slope of about 5% away from the building. 
some of these buildings in Fort Wayne County, they got a little skirt around them to keep the moisture from changing. When you go out there and build these buildings, the pad, uh, make sure uh, you don't use sand when you do pad construction. Use a structural fill, you know, sandy clay, even clay. But typically, uh, you know, slight structural fill is the base, best thing. Select structural fill is a soil with liquid limit less than 40 and PI between 12 and 20. You have to remove the expansive soils and uh, replace them with non expensive soils to get your PVR to one inch. So if you got a site, an aggregate zone of 10 feet, PI of 60, you got to remove seven foot of soil to get the PVR to one inch, which is uneconomical. So, the type of foundations we have are deep foundations that include drill piers, piling, auger cast piles, hillco piles, press piling, conventional reinforcer slab. That's a shallow foundation. Post tension slab, spread footings, and mats. Those are the type of type of foundation systems that we have in Texas, typically. So if you're a structural engineer, you're gonna to have to talk to your client about the foundations and risks. Um, the lowest risk of foundation is a structural slab appears. Then the slab on fill on piers to get the PVR to less than one inch. Next is a floating stiffened slab supported on piers. You do a slab stiff so it can move up, but it cannot go down because of the presence of piers. So it's called a floating stiffened slab. Next one is a floating super slab. This is a six inch slab with gray beams, interior beams too. Uh, it doesn't require compaction of the soil underneath it if your gray beams into the natural soils. And that's why it's, a, it's what we call a super slab, conventional reinforcer slab or post tension. So, drill piers is a drill pier, pier foundation. This is a drilling auger, and this is the reamer right there. They're trying to build a building in here, start drilling. It's an auger, this is the reamer right there. It's an auger, reamer. You drill first, you measure the reamer, make sure it opens up properly. Uh, you check the piers, make sure there's no water in it. You can have up to about three inches of water in your hole. And <coughs> make sure it's not <laughs> caving. Then you put your steel cage in there. Pull concrete, make sure the concrete doesn't hit the sides of the hole. Otherwise, you're gonna get clay in there. So you gotta be either trimming it down or pull it down straight as long as it doesn't hit the sides. And uh, you can see the bell, steel coming out from the bell. You don't bend, bend the steel into the slab. You basically, this is your pier, your steel coming out, you put a sleeve on it. That allows the gray beam to move up and down from the piers if they hit expansive soils problems. Again, this is the drill pier. You can see the steel coming up. This is the void box. Uh, this is your gray beam. The steel is not, stops in here. It doesn't even go in the gray beams. It allows the beam to move up and down. Here's a typical makeup on a, on a, on a foundation. You got interior beams. That's for a small foundation like residential. Pier depths, you got waffle slab here with interior beams. Okay, the way we determine pier depths is very important. We have two concepts here. One concept is called moisture active zone. The other one is a movement active zone. Movement active zone, which is equal to what we call zero movement line, the soil above this area does not move up and move up and down. It does move out, up and down. Below it, do not move up and down. So in our reports, when we pick up the root fibers, we define the uh, moisture active zone. The movement active zone in Houston is about 10 feet. 
in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin is about 15 feet. But your active zone in Houston can be 10, 20 feet deep. In San Antonio, it can be as much as 60 feet deep. In Dallas, Las Colinas, your active zone can be 40 foot deep, 50 foot deep. It just, the soil changes moisture. But because of the weight of the soil, it doesn't move up and down. So your movement active zone is about 15 feet in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. So if you would have an active zone underneath your structure near the tree, your active zone is going to be deeper because the tree is sucking that moisture out. This oil stays drier. So when it gets wet, it can heave up more. So your active zone next to a tree is deeper. The depth of constant suction or active zone, the way you determine that is when you hit a sand layer, you hit a rock layer, two foot below the lowest root fiber. When your suck, soil suction is less than 0.02 PF, when your liquidity index becomes vertical, or you have a depth of sticking sides, or if you know the depth of historical water table, which is very hard to determine. So if you got a pier, you want to determine the pier depth. You got to go deep enough to resist uh, uh, downward movement. You got unbearing, end bearing, and skin friction. You don't count on the skin friction within the top 10 foot or so, at least five foot of the soil here because of shrink swell problems. This is what we call zero movement line. The soils above this area move. Soils below this area do not move. Here's the second test. This is what we call zero movement line. The soil below here anchor the pier down. The soil above here, they want to grab the pier and push it up. You don't count on the bell to resist pier uplift. By the time the bell gets engaged, you have moved two, three inches. So your superstructure is already cracked. So it's important when you do uplift calculations on pier depths, you don't count the pier. You see this straight shaft. So the rule of thumb is if your active zone is 10 foot, if your soils are highly expansive, your pier depth should be at least 20 foot. But if it's got a high, you know, lots of load on it, like you got a tit wall panel, it can be shallower than 20 foot. These are some uh, panels out there, sound walls on zero piers in Pearland. If you go look at them, there are heavy loads on them. But some of these piers are coming up uh, because the piers were too shallow. See this thing's coming up. Here's a, a question here we have. Somebody's asking regarding the void box above the drill pier, how is the pier supporting the foundation if foundation is free from float above to the void box? Well, your grading is sitting uh, on top of the pier. And the space between the piers is where you got void boxes. You don't have void boxes uh, where you have a pier or grade beam connection. I want to talk about that in a minute. So it's the Target store out there on I-10 near downtown. You know, in the in mid, uh, midtown area or the Heights. Look at that tar Target. You go inside of it. Apparently, there's a lot of cracks inside the building. It's a tail wall building with panels here, with piers, columns. The piers are like 10, 12 foot deep or so. They're too shallow for the soils that's out there. There's two foot of select field underneath it, which doesn't reduce the PVR. So this thing has no stiffness. It's just a five, six inch slab sitting on top of highly expansive soils with PVR or greater than one. That's why the slab is moving. So these are the typical construction where you have your columns, your slab here, you're gonna to have to design the slab with the PBR less than one inch. You put a joint out there between the, the column and the, uh, the concrete so that they allow the slab move up and down. That's the joint right there, the fill paper. Or sometimes you have these diamond shape or circular shape uh, joints around the columns. That allows the, the, the pier, you see, what happens is usually this area does not move. The slab moves, so it causes movement and cracking. Here's a diamond shape, shape one, columns going in there like that. So for a typical lightly loaded structure, 
a school building here. I got a site, it's got clays. My PI is 50, active zone is 10 foot. What's my peer depth? My active zone is 10 foot, movement active zone of 10 foot. Then my peer is gonna be about 20 foot deep. I got another site here, we got clay from zero to 10. My active zone is above the sand layer, 10 foot. So where's the pier? It's gotta go in the sand. So that means you gotta use what's called slurry method of construction. And um, so it's gonna be more expensive, a lot more expensive. This is a case where you may start looking at using helical piles as opposed to drill piers because helical piles are cheaper than drill piers when you use the slurry method of construction. So if there's a pier depth, if you're in Houston, your active zone is movement active zone is four to 10 foot. Uh, let's see. If movement active zone is in four to 10 foot, your pier depths are about, you know, eight to 20 feet. Dallas, if your active zone is eight to 20 foot move, movement, your pier can be, uh, uh, 40 foot deep, you know, 16, 20 foot. San Antonio, if you're moving active zone is 10 to 15, 30 feet, which it doesn't usually is about 15 foot. Uh, so your pier depth can be as much as 20 to about 30 foot deep. In Austin, same with the same one in Austin. Depth of active movement, you know, movement active zone is 10 foot in Houston. Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin is 15 foot. Floor slab treatment under the foundations. If your soles are expansive, use a structural slab with void. Or slab on fill, or you do chemical injection. If your soles are non-expansive, you just compact that soil and build on top of it. Structural slab, you know, AM, University of Houston. Uh, all are looking at using uh, structural slabs, same with Rice University. A lot of projects that they do, they use a structural slab system. The slab is structurally supported as a void here. You go underneath, that's what it looks like. These are more structural slabs in San Antonio. Notice the soils are cracking, the dry, expansive soils. That's your grade beam here. This is your piers coming out. The structure is structurally supported. It's a typical building out there. There's a crawl space in it. The building is set above this area. Residential projects, they do a lot of residential and structural slab because of the flooding problems that we have. So if you go to West U Bell area out there, it's Hangerwood and all those areas, they build a structural slab system, the garage is at grade. And then they build a structural slab with a crawl space. Here's another house in West University, precast concrete floor slabs. This is a house out there in Friendswood. Guy said, I don't want to have any movement. So they had all these big trees in here in the backyard. They had to cut all these trees, highly expansive soils. They go structural slab system, steel frame. Piers out here, this is your steel. The whole thing started moving. Geotechnical engineers said, put the piers at 20 feet. The structural engineer on his own decided the piers that should be 10 foot. Well, they cut the trees, and I'm going to talk about that in a little while. When you cut a tree, the, the whole area starts heaving up. And so the whole thing started heaving up. These are the trial pictures of the construction of the, the slab. This is another house out there in Braves Heights, structural slab system, the crawl space. This is the trial pictures. They got grade beams. They didn't put any void boxes underneath the grade beams. That's the crawl space. The house cracked up. And uh, the piers were 10 foot deep. You know, the design was faulty. Here's another one, house 
in C Seabrook. There's a call space in here. You go inside of it. They went out there and tried a foundation repair guys to level the house. They put them on little blocks here on the surface. Okay. These are the repair piers or spread footing. These are the original piers. They did the house without the soil test. They put the piers at eight feet. Which is totally wrong. Considering the, you know, the side was wooded with trees, the pier should have been 18, 20 foot deep. So the whole thing started heating up. The contractor goes in there and put these columns in there on spread footing. They level it after one season, the stool starts moving, the whole house starts moving again. So we told them they have to remove all these because they were just shallow footings. They shimmed up on top of them, on top of the, the beams under the slab. Structural slab on void boxes. Some of these projects on residential and commercial, they put on void boxes. These are the void boxes that should be in the floor slabs and in the grade beams between the piers. Okay, you don't put void boxes on top of piers. So that's how you run it. This is where you want the void boxes in for the beams. These are cardboard void boxes. When they get wet, they start basically falling apart, creating a void underneath the foundation. So when the expansive soil heaves up, it's not going to lift your foundation. This is what we put in the gray beams. So if you got a gray beam like that, you put void boxes here and you put void boxes here between the piers. You don't put void boxes where the piers are. So these are the void boxes. You cover them with sheeting, vapor barrier. Then you start studying your steel. Here's another place, what we call two-way slab residential foundation by Sterling Found you know, Engineering. You go out there, and uh, if your soils are non-expansive, you drill your piers. There's no grade beam here, okay? So what you do is just go out, compact that soil, and uh, you don't have to compact it that hard because of the all all the slab is going to need here is to be able to support it. The soil needs to support the slab, which is only you know six seven inches. And you put your grade beams in, and then you go out there and you put your plumbing. Since there's no grade beams, you don't have to, you know, basically cut the grade beams to get the plumbing through it. And you can see the, the area here is the drop caps. It's where your piers are. You got post tension cables. It's a six or seven inch concrete slab. Drop caps, steel. This is a temperature steel here. So there's steel going from pier to pier. You pour a six to seven inch um, concrete slab on it. And it's, it's all supported on piers, no grade beams. Um, if you have expansive soil, you just put a void box underneath it and pour it. Here's another deal, a stab tech out there in Dallas. They go out there and drill the piers, the rim them. These are the piers, full extension cables. They have a thing called a puck. It's a little block that they put on top of the piers in between the post tension slabs, cables. These are the pucks. They pour the concrete where the puck is, they remove the top. They screw, put the screw in there on top of it, then they screw it on top of the pier. And as they screw it down the pier, the slab moves up. They create a void out of the slab. So they put it in, start turning. Um, they got a big handle here. Start turning the screws. As they turn the screws, the slab will move up. They turn it with a handle. You can create a void, a structural slab. Here's a six inch void created under the slab. Backfill it with uh, polymer or grout. It's the typical slab finished. Again, here the slab has been moved up. These are the columns. 
It's a commercial. The slab is moved up. And there's a void here. Structural slab on gray beams. You go to heights, they got this so-called structural slab that they do. They put gray beams, you know, around the structure. Usually CMU blocks. This is like a foot deep, not very deep. And uh, they have wood out there. The soils are non-expansive in the heights. So that's why they do it. And they put the beams in there and all that. And you can see they pour the beams in some areas. They put them on piers. And they go and put the beams out there for the structural slab. The piers could be 15, 20 foot deep. These are structural slab system because of the flooding. That's a house with a crawl space. Structural slab on post tension slab. You get a post tension slab like this. You put stem walls around it above the grade beams. That creates a crawl space. So you pour your floating slab out there at grade, no piers. You start putting your stem wall. That's what it looks like, crawl space on top of post tension slab. Make sure your crawl space is clean. Make sure it's basically sloped so the water drains away from the interior. You don't want to have your whole water just sitting underneath your foundation. So make sure you take all the trash. Don't leave any trash out there. This is not acceptable. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. Hit a piles. Where you have slurry method of construction on your piers, like you're in Westview, Bel Air, Tanglewood, areas where you're going to have to have used slurry in Rosenberg, you use helical pile system. This is the steel stem, this is helixes. Like that. This is, goes underneath the grade beams. These are the helixes. It's a typical project. You've got to have a site like that. These are the helicals, usually get two plates on them. Make sure you got the right size plate so that it doesn't go deeper than 20 feet. If you get small plates, it goes down 30, 40 foot, they charge you extra. So make sure that, you know, they have proper, good proper, do a test, test pier. You know, measure, measure the, the, you know, the capacity with your, with your plates. Because I see people getting uh, ripped off because they use small plates on their helical piles. You start putting the hill pile in the ground. See the plates. You screw into the ground. Add the next stem to it. Drive it in. These are typical hill piles. You screw them into the ground. You just leave them in there. Put them in the gray beams. Support commercial projects. These are the helicals. Helicals is on a lightly loaded structure. Sometimes <laughs> you drill a hole 12 inches in diameter and put the helicals through it. And then you fill it up with concrete. That gives you a hard lateral capacity on your helical piles because, you know, these stems, the poles are usually like two inches in diameter. So they don't have much lateral capacity unless you put them in batter. You can also drill bigger holes and fill up with concrete to increase the lateral capacity. You do batter or helical piles to resist lateral loads. And this is a helical pile with the helical pile and gray beams, which avoid boxes in between. Pour your slab. <coughs> Timber pile foundations. If you're building out there in the Galveston area, use a lot of timber piles on some of the houses out there. You got those beach houses sitting on piling. These are wood treated piles. Like that. 
Some of them are square piles, 10 inch by 10 inch or 12 inch by 12 inch square piles. You drop them to the ground, you don't push them in. It's not pushing, it's not acceptable. You drop them in with a hammer. You gotta follow text dot 404 specifications. These are timber piles. Make sure you don't crack them when you're out there and start driving these piles. Fiberglass piles. Um, they use fiberglass on some of these projects. They're really nice. They last for a long time. They're not cheaper. So they go in there and uh, drive the fiberglass piles in the ground. Some of them you fill up with concrete. Some of them you don't. You can drive them in, you can vibrate them in. Here you can drive them in. Here's some pictures of the hurricane, after the hurricane beach houses in Galveston when they put shallow piles in there. But some of these contractors, you know, they don't get a soil test. They just go out there and drive these things in 10 foot and say, that's it. So a lot of these beach houses starts tilting. Pre-stressed concrete piles on some of the heavy structures. If you've got bad soils, you can use piling, which is expensive. These are pre-stressed concrete square piles, big surface area and end bearing. You just drive them into the ground. Uh, let's see. Again, you can see the Aggie guy doing driving the piles in here and they put them in an angle. Yeah, this is supposed to be a video. It's not working. Maybe Vicky can get it to work. Let's see. Hey, Vicky. Oh. Uh, well, I don't know either. Down in the corner, right there, over the other way. No, 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 no. Go back up on the picture. See the play button over there? Yeah. Nope. Must be something wrong with it. Okay, we can't see the video. Second, let's see if we can. Next year, we'll look at steel pipe piles. The steel pipe piles are great. Drive them to the ground, they're expensive. You know, these are the steel pipe piles. You drive them in, you drive them open ended most of the time. They get plugged. Once they get plugged, they can carry in bearing. You can calculate the plug depth. So, see at what depth they can get plugged. And here, here's again driving piles there, auger cast pile foundations. This is the auger cast pile, drill them into the ground. These are the spoils coming up as they drill. There's a hole in the middle. The, the grout comes out through it. And as the grout is pushed in there and you unscrew it. So the whole area gets filled with grout. Here's the deal here. You can see the end of the bottom of it. You push this steel cage in there after you, you drill and grout the hole. These are the cages. You just push them in. Typical uh, building out there on Gessner Avenue and I-10, and that's uh, Memorial Herman, uh, that's sitting on auger cast in place piles. Conventional reinforcer slab, just a slab with no piers. You got interior beams. All right, we got a question here. Anonymous attendee, what type of soils are not suitable for ACI piles due to excessive caving and groundwater? washing out the grout. Um, we use, you know, auger cast piles on any soils. 
the thing that makes them, you know, good is because if you even have sand, you know, you can put an auger gas pile to sand. You just have to watch the grout pressure and all that stuff and do quality assurance. But uh, I don't know of any problem with putting your auger cast piles in clay or sandy soils. Slab on grade. Foundations, you got beams, interior beams and exterior beams. It's a typical makeup. That's the beams. We put the steel in there. He's on mild steel. You don't put post tension cable in a conventionally brab slab. This is your great beam excavation for your waffle slab. You get the plumbers to go in there and tear everything up. Make sure they go back in and compact everything 95% of standard proctor density. The whole side has to be proof rolled before you put anything in. Put your vapor barrier in there. It's like that, then you put your steel on top of it. Pump concrete, finish it. Do not use rolled mesh steel. This is rolled mesh steel. It ends up in the bottom of this whole thing. Look at these guys here. They're pouring concrete. The steel is all the way in the bottom. That's not acceptable to pull the steel as you pour. Make sure you got nice chairs there. That's not acceptable to pull concrete on top of steel, on top of vapor barrier. The steel comes out on the bottom. If you excavate under the slab, you see the sleeve, sleeve is, the steel is on the bottom. This is totally <coughs> unacceptable. They put the steel in, then they put vapor barrier on top of the steel, then they're pouring concrete on top of it. So this Bubba doesn't know what he's doing. Post tension slab, they're a great foundation system. They're cheap. Uh, you can see the interior beams. Um, try to keep it as much as you can to square or rectangle. The more indentation you have in it, the more potential for cracking. Great beams. This guy's got a cable here, a cable there through the beam. Sometimes you put two cables if your soils are expensive. This is your waffle slab. You, you put your cables in it. This is where your sinks are. It's the live end. It's the dead end. Dead end. And you can see here, it's the live end that can start pulling it here. The typical makeup here, make sure this vapor barrier is in good contact with the soil. It cannot be hanging. It gotta be in contact. All the grass must be removed before you go out there and set your vapor barrier in. There's no grass should be allowed in your, in your floor slab areas. This is not acceptable. Cannot be just, just hanging in there. You pump the concrete in, you want to keep your slump to less than five inches. That's what PTI recommends. You go out there after you pull the slab, when the concrete straighten gets about 2,000 PSI, you're going to start stre stressing. You don't stand in front of it. You go try that away from where the you know, jack is. Make sure this is calibrated. You measure the elongations per what the structural engineer gives you. These are the live cables. You measure the elongations. Typically, we initially, the cables got zero load. Then we loaded 33 kips with time. It's called wedge sitting. It drops to about 28.9. Then it drops to 26.5 kips. Intention, the cable that puts the concrete in compression. Post tension slabs are generally less expensive than conventional reinforced slab. Go cut the ends, grouting this pockets, make sure prior to installing the grout, the area got to be nice and clean if you have dirt and grit and oil so that the concrete have a good bond bond with the, with the slab. A bonding agent can be used. All this area got to be cleaned up. 
The stressing pocket should be filled with non-shrink, non-metallic grout as soon as possible after tendon stressing and cutting. Under no circumstances should the grout pockets be left exposed for extended period of time. You put the plastic thing on top of it, then uh, under no circumstances should the grout be used. Grout used for pocket filling should contain chlorides or chemicals so that uh, they're going to mess up your steel cables. You cover it up with concrete. Look at this thing here, the bridge, the, the brick ledge. You got to make sure you got a level and square brick ledge here. Troweling on big uh, slabs, like commercial, like a tilt wall building, you go troweling just to make it level, take out the, the stuff that's not smooth. You don't do that for a house job. Waffle mat, post tension slabs. This is in use in Austin, parts of Texas, and they're kind of doing a lot of research on this system. You go out there and uh, remove the grass and weeds and all that and improve all the area. Uh, put vapor barrier in. And then you put your void box, I mean, put this uh, plastic boxes like that. That's your beam right there. And uh, put your cables in. If you got a plumbing, you take one of the boxes out. There's a lot of interior beams. Pretty stiff slab. You pull concrete. These are your cables. You got to go stress them. That's a waffle mat slab. If you want your beams deeper, you cut it, you know, with this device. Uh, you put vapor barrier in. And then you put your grade beams on top of it. That makes your grade beam deeper. Therefore, you reduce your movements. Here's the device. Here's the ditch which You cut the grade beam. And you put vapor barrier in there to get uh, reduce the moisture on a slab. As you have less moisture moving onto the slab, Less movement you're going to get. Uh, we're at the end here. Affected trees on foundations. Trees affect foundations significantly. People like to put trees next to foundations. And these trees affect foundations significantly. When you got a project like this, you got tree next to this slab here. With time, these uh, trees suck the moisture. If the tree dies, that slab is going to move. If you go out there and get a heavily wooded site and you clear that and you build a uh, slab on top of it, you need to consider the effect of trees on floating slab foundations, like conventional reinforcer slab and post tension slab. Even on, on the sites where you're going to use piers or auger cast piles, when you cut the trees, you look at the soil suction is a measure of the free energy of the soil. Soil suction may be described as the ability of an unsaturated soil to attract retained water. So you measure the suction. This is the equilibrium suction. This is a typical dry 4.5. And this is a 3.0. On a post-construction, post-equilibrium site, basically the soil goes from equilibrium to dry, or from equilibrium to wet. Okay, well, if you have a tree, if you don't have a tree, that's what it looks like to your suction profile. It goes from basically, a, equilibrium to a dry to a wet condition for example but if you have a tree the whole area is so dry your moisture profile suction moves from 4.5 all the way to 3.0 which causes lots of movement and swelling we developed uh, this uh, software that, that basically gives you pti values based on the tree removal or died if you got sites got a tree if you don't want to consider the effective tree, your Y sub M values are 1.4, 1.6 for a PI of 40 soil, 1.2, 1.4. If your beams are two and a half foot deep. If you have to take out the tree, this jumps to 5.3 to 1.6, your edge lift and center lift for a PI of 40. With the 2.5 foot grade beams drops to, uh, increases to 4.5, 4 4.8 and 1.4. Yeah, case three. After one year, the soil starts rehydrating. Your Y sub M values drop to 2.5 and 
for 2.4 foot peers, 2.5 foot peers, I mean, great beams drops to 2.0 to 1.4. After two years, your numbers go back to 1.4 to 1.6, 1.2 to 1.4. The same thing with the PI at 67, the PI without the tree removal consideration, your PBR, your Y sub N values are 1.8 to 1.2.0. Then when you take the tree out, it jumps to 10.8. So when you have these high numbers of Y sub M, you got to do chemical injection. Like I said, we have a lot of expansive soils through Texas. These are the highly expansive soils that run through Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. There's a concept called thorn moisture content. That's a measure of how much water we're retaining versus how much we evaporate. If your TMI, thorn moisture index, is positive, that means you retain more moisture than you have evaporation. If your TMI is negative, uh, you will have more evaporation than the, than the retention of the moisture. Places such as Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, they have zero to negative TMI as opposed to Houston, which is plus 18. Okay, so if you look at aerial photos of the Texas uh, slab on great foundation in areas where TMI is less than 20 or between 20 and zero, in these areas, uh, your moisture is deficient. So if you get a rainfall, it starts getting edge lift. So this area, you get edge lift. This area where you got positive uh, moisture content and wet, I mean, when you go through a drought, uh, what you get is a center lift, which means that edge of the slab starts shrinking. So look at the uh, climatic conditions around Texas and the US, you can see what your slab is going to do in terms of movement, depending with which area of the TMI you're located. <laughs> One way you can reduce movement is chemical injection. You go out there and just use these chemicals. After the chemical injection, your Y sub M values are about 1.2 to 1.4. For a PI 62 soils, you inject to an up to 10 feet with percentage to a swell of about 0.8. Uh, 1.0 percent, so maximum PVR is 1.2 inches. Spread footings. Uh, some of the buildings out there in Texas, we, if your soils are non-expansive, we use the spread footings. So in these buildings that are sitting on the spread footings, these are what the spread footings look like. The column loads come over here, sitting on top of the spread footings. You dig a hole make it square, rectangle, whatever, you put your steel in it. You bring it all the way up, pull concrete. These are the columns going up. There's a spread footing here. You put the steel in there, you're doing chairs, pull concrete. Matt Foundation, if you're pouring your big building, if you got a big building that you're doing, uh, these high rises, you put them on mats. Go downtown Chase Tower. You know, these are the streets in here. These are the towers that they're going to go in. You put a mat foundation in Texas, in Houston, you excavate the soil to reduce contact pressure. If your tower has got a pressure of 5,000 PSF contact pressure, so you're going to want to, you want to get it down to about 2,000 PSF so that you don't experience settlement. You got to have to dig out 3,000 PSF of soil. That's why all these high-rise buildings downtown, they got basements. So to, to do that, you got 3,000, roughly, you're going to have to dig out 25 foot of soil to get that, to remove that 3,000 PSF load. So the math foundation here, essentially, if you take out 3,000 and your, your slab was 5,000, here it just feels 2,000 PSF. These are soils downtown Houston and you got lots of clays, sand, soils and all that. Because of the lot of clays, we have settlement problems. So you dig out your mat out there, come compact everything, proof roll it. As you go deeper, you gotta put soldier piles in, with tiebacks, you gotta do dewatering. To put your steel in when you get to the design depth. Start pouring the concrete on your mat. 
this mat here that had 8,000 yards of concrete. You got to worry about the heat of the, uh, pouring the concrete. That concrete gets pretty hot. These are your columns coming out of the mat. Again, as you go deeper, you put tiebacks in, you drill these soldier piles. These are the soldier piles. As you go deeper, you put tiebacks in there. This is an auger, you put a tie back in. These are the tie backs. This is the wood lagging. Again, chemical stabilization on lightly loaded structures underneath the floor slabs. You do a chemical injection, and it, the way it works is by a cation exchange. Essentially, it removes. The chemical injection will remove the sodium and potassium and put calcium in there and reduces the clay double layer clay platelets. These are clay platelets. It does not as big as much. It reduces it so they have less water in it. So it doesn't he heave as much. You can do lime slurry pressure injection. This is a lime. You mix it with water. You inject it. That's cation exchange. I don't see it done very much. Chemical injection, we see that a lot. It's like sulfuric acid. You inject it into the soil. When you inject into the soil, the soil doesn't swell anymore. You get the percent swell less than 1%. We typically specify 0.8%. So that corresponds to a PBR of one inch at the top. These are chemical injection. We do that for tail wall buildings, residential and commercial projects. They do them through Texas, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, Houston. You can do it by hand as well. It's not as effective. Soils where chemical injections are effective on are the soils that crack a lot. So the chemicals can travel through the cracks with shrinkage cracks. The more shrinkage cracks, the better it is. So we got, <laughs> we got a, question, a question here. Mark, how do you deal with heat of hydration with the uh, concrete mat? Uh, that's a big problem. You're going to have to look at your mix design. Shoot me an email. I'll send you a response on that. Affect the trees. Trees affect foundations significantly. Um, these are the root systems. You can see the trees falling over. Not acceptable. Tree roots grow three dimensional. See the tree roots going there. This is my house. You can see the tree going right through it. I'm a tree hugger. I like trees. It's my vacation house. That's the tree hugger guy. That's a house that people like to build houses near trees. When you put the trees out there next to a house, before you build, make sure you take all the roots out. If the roots stay here underneath your slab, they decay and create pathways for water to travel. So with time they decay, if this is your slab, then that's where the roots used to be. And surface water can penetrate and cause heat underneath your slab. So all the roots need to come out that's bigger than half an inch, I mean, one inch, half an inch in diameter. Root heave, you cut the, basically root systems go underneath uh, the, the beams, underneath the walls to get moisture. They try to get moisture. As they do that, they, they lift up the sidewalks, they lift up the side, you know, the walls. Call root heave. This is a willow tree, this is a house. This is a root system going underneath the slab. The whole slab was heaved up about like two inches in the, in the floor slab inside the building. This is a pine tree. They have a lot of superficial roots in pine trees. These roots get underneath the slab. This is a house in the woodlands area. And they had the floor slab heaved up. They jackhammer the floor slab. They pull the roots out, going underneath the slab. Here's the root systems going underneath the slab. See the hairline roots? They go out there because it's cool, because of the capillary action. There's moisture. And uh, they're trying to get moisture that way. 
So you basically tree, remove the tree roots, compact that soil, put vapor barrier in, and pull concrete. Soil heba <laughs> due to tree removal. Oh, this is a big problem in design. The structural engineers need to be aware of this because if they're not, they're going to get themselves in trouble. Trouble. So if you got a site where you got this big oak tree out here, you're going to take it out. And it doesn't matter where the tree is. If the tree outside the fence of the where you're going to build, just because you got a fence, it doesn't matter. That tree, if he dies, is going to make this building move two, three inches upward if it was not designed for it. So you got to design for trees dying. You got these trees here, and this is the house. When these trees die, this house is going to move up. If your side is wooded. You got to take those trees out, those root systems, make sure anything more than half an inch come out. When you cut those trees, the ground starts heaving. This is a, basically from England. This is the building, point H and point F. Tree was taken out near point H. And you can see as when the tree was taken out near point H, it heaved up about uh, 6.3 inches, 160 millimeters. And in, in, at point H, point F, which is farther away, it moved 20 millimeters, which is almost one inch. So as you get further away from a tree, when you cut that tree, the, the, the movement reduces. This is the AIA building downtown Houston. It used to be AIA building. Downtown Houston has got that tree out there next to the building. The tree is 400 years old. You see the branches. This is the moisture profile on the tree. It's the tree trunk. On the ground, it's a depth of 10 feet, sucking the moisture all the way to twice the height of the tree. So if the tree is 50 feet, this distance is 100 feet, it's taking out moisture to a depth of three feet. Okay. So if you design this for, for a building here next to that tree, you got to design for this tree dying. The active zone is 10 feet, twice the height. You go back to depth of three feet. The brown area is where it's going to heave up when that tree dies. You got to design for this tree. If you, you know, if you put a foundation there, it's going to heave up. So you got to go with a structural slab with deep piers or do chemical injection or do removal and replacements. So you can do some of that stuff um, to handle the situation. But basically, the root spread is bigger than the drip line of the tree. This is a house in Austin. There were three trees in the backyard. They cut them. The soil had PIs between 50 and 60 inches. Elevation heaved up about the area when the tree was taken out. 8.2 inches of heave within two weeks of, of removal of the trees. This is Texas a and research that shows number of years soil rehydration when you take a tree out. At one year, you rehydrate about 40%. At two years, you rehydrate about 60%. Five years, you rehydrate 100% if you have more share available. Third move, more the movement for tree shrinkage due to moisture removal. This is long, uh, this is a Houston Community College downtown. You got these post oak trees. It's sucking the moisture from underneath this building. So edge of this building is dropping. So you go inside the building, there's a crack, the edge is dropping, there's the crack. The piers are only 12 foot deep, so they're shallow. So the whole thing acts like a floating slab system because of the shallow piers. And so University of Texas did research, if you put a tree a distance away from a structure of equal to its height, if D over H of is one, on the average, they were 0.2 feet of shrinkage, almost 2.4 inches of shrinkage occurred for a tree that's equal to its height or future height away from a structure. So they go out there, put these big trees next to these structures. That's not a good idea because these trees can heat, basically die and the, the building's going to heave up. Yeah, the soils under the slab settle and the slab is going to start sagging. This is the void under the slab because of the tree sucking all the moisture out. 
So if you got trees, oak trees, you want to put them at least one H away from a building, depending on the tree species. If you got a poplar tree, you want to put it one H. Lime, 0.5 H. So just depending where you, what kind of trees you have, elm tree, 0.5 H. H is the you know, future height of the, clay, uh, of the tree. So this is what we call trees from hell. Some measures to prevent uh, tree dress distress. Somebody asking is, uh, would you repair root barriers? Yes, so we're there now. Some measures to prevent tree distress. If these are your trees, you put them away from building as much as you can. Don't put near the foundation. Have a hole next to the tree trunk so that the water just stays there and doesn't go away. Put sprinkler system so that we can water the trees so that the root system do not have to go anywhere. Put root barriers. When the root comes out, they go down, they don't go lateral. You have planted trees with root barriers around them. We usually like them to be at least four foot deep. These are typical deep root system tree barriers. Bio barriers, you can use those things. They got herbicide pills. Root systems hit them, they stun them. They last about 10 years, so they're not very good. Put pots around the building. So this was the building that had all kinds of problems. Plant the planter areas and stuff, so we put pots around it. So in summary, you need to do proper geotechnical work for your project. This is your proper geotechnical contract amount. If there's foundation problems, this is what we call change order boat. It costs a lot of money to go fix it. So it's important to do proper geotechnical work on these projects with competent and experienced people. Uh, if you got projects, uh, send me pictures of the distressed buildings. I appreciate that. We can use it in our presentation. And uh, I need pictures. Uh, also, we do an evaluation in here. Tell me what you think of the presentation. If you need to add something, uh, I really want to know if you can do better or send me an email. Uh, in order to get on our programs, I need to have your email. So this is my information, de at geotechng.com. 713-699-4000. These are some of the programs that we got coming up. On 1110, we got retaining walls, geotechnical consideration with design of retaining walls. And then I've got a presentation with GHBA, four-hour design construction of forensic evaluation of residential foundations. And then what we have, evaluation of foundation distress on 12-1. So we got a lot of programs. Send us your email that we put you on the program. You're going to get your PDH hour, so hopefully by tomorrow. Any question? I have a question here. How you build drain flower bed adjacent to slab on great foundation? Now that's part of another presentation that I have. Uh, that GHBA <laughs> presentation addresses that, but typically we don't like Topsoil next to foundations. Topsoils are sandy. And if you got a clay site, that water just becomes a perch water table next to your foundation and causes heave. So, or your planter areas use, you know, gumbo clays or regular clays, but don't use sand or topsoil for in the planter areas. Make sure you got 5% slope away from the slab. But if you got a topsoil hole in there, Water just going to sit in there and, and uh, it's not going to drain off. So don't put topsoil near your foundation. Any other question? Well, I had a cold, so that's why you know, I don't feel that great. But uh, email me your questions. I'll respond. Again, send me your information so that we can put you on our database and uh, fill in the evaluation form. Thank you very much. You all have a great one. Thank you very much.